We are going through the fruit of the Spirit. What was the first one? What was the first one we studied? Love. Then? Then? Four? Patience. And then today is kindness, right? That sounds nice, right? We all like to talk about kindness, right? You don't have to, you don't have to sweat today, right? But kindness is something that we all need. Maybe I'll make you sweat a little later on. Okay, but kindness is something I think that we all need and we love to be able to reflect to others and we love to have others reflect that to us as well. So we're looking at our, our, at our main verse in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. So we've seen love, joy, peace, and last week we studied patience. This week we're going to study kindness. Next week, goodness. Um, and all these beautiful fruit of the Spirit. Remember, this, these fruits of the Spirit are born in our lives in conjunction together. They're not just solo fruits. You can't just say, I want love, but patience is not for me, right? They all work together. They, some of these overlap with each other, like we'll see next week when we study goodness. You'll see a little bit of overlap with kindness and goodness. So they overlap, they join together, they grow together, they help one another, and in our lives, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to produce these fruits in our lives so that we could, um, so that we could reflect the nature and character of Christ uh, for, for others. So um, last week we looked as well at 1 Corinthians 13 when we saw this chapter of love and at the beginning um, it said, the, uh, when it talked about love in verse 4, the characteristics of love, does anyone remember what the first characteristic was? Love is patient, right? That was last week's theme, so love is patient. Do you know what the second thing that says love is? Kind. kind. That was a giveaway because we are talking about kindness, right? Love is patient and love is kind, right? Love is kind. So this aspect of, of, of love that is kind, I would say if patience is the passive trait of love, in the sense that if you love, you'll be patient with other people, it's more of a passive trait, kindness is the active trait of love, okay? Kindness is the active trait of love, or we can say that kindness is... Love in action, right? Kindness is love in action. Webster's Dictionary defines kindness as of a sympathetic or helpful nature. I say kindness is the, is the act of love, the, uh, the action of love, the practical expression of love, right? So the essence of kindness is to be thoughtful of others, uh, to think of others more than yourself in a particular situation. Um, we might have to put ourselves in other people's shoes in order to be able to uh, see what they would want and experience what they actually experience. So kindness can be a, as simple as a word of encouragement, a smile, a deed, a simple act. Uh, Mark Twain, he said, kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Kindness is the language that the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Now, I'll give you some Greek here today. So this is the actual word for kindness, Christotes, okay? It appears 10 times in the New Testament, and only in Paul's letters is this actual word appear, Christotes, which means kindness. It's a smaller word for kind, which we'll, I'll, I'll come to later on near the end of the message. But I think if we have to understand what kindness is or the definition of kindness, I think the first thing we have to see is how is kindness related to God and how is kindness related to God's character, Right, So it, when we talk about God, it denotes his, his gracious attitude, his actions towards humanity. Right, Salvation uh, is a manifestation of God's kindness. What we experience today in celebrating the Lord's table and remembering Jesus' sacrifice on Calvary for us is a remembrance of God's kindness, the expression of God's kindness and salvation to us. In the book of, um, in the book of Titus, we read, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. So when the kindness of God appeared, when Jesus came into this world and died on the cross, we see this as a manifestation, a personification of the kindness of God in Jesus Christ towards us to come and die for us and to grant us salvation. I think the greatest act of kindness is what we remember today when we partook of the Lord's table. The greatest act of kindness, I believe, is when Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary and 
forgave us of our sins. In Ephesians 2, it says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So here I think what Paul is talking about is that God reveals his kindness towards us and he seats us in heavenly places with Christ so that in the ages to come, people will look back and say, wow, Daniel made it. That's real kindness right? Or put your name there. When, when the, in ages to come, when they'll see the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now, often we think kindness is just doing good to each other. Now, that's correct, and I think that's probably a good definition that the world has. And I think it's a really big thing in culture these days is that you should be kind to others. It's huge in culture today that you should be kind to other people, you should love other people, you should be tolerant of other people, you should be supportive uh, of other people, and that's a great thing. But the kindness of God goes to another level. The kindness of God is not just about being good to others. The kindness of God is not just about being good to those who do good for you, being good to your husband or wife or friends or family or relatives or people that are nice to you. We, you know, we can do that, the world does that. Everyone can, can try to do that to a degree. Do you know what the kindness of God is really defined as? Doing good to your enemies. Being kind to those that have hurt you. Being kind to those that have done evil towards you. Why? Because the word of God says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, the kindness of God was revealed to mankind. While we were enemies of God, we were far away from God, the kindness of God was revealed and manifested. And so kindness is not just about doing a good deed for someone else, and that's good, it is, part of kindness is, Right? That's a good thing, and I encourage each and every one of us to, to aim for that, to strive for that, to do good to others, to do good to those, our coworkers, our family, our friends, and those around us. That's great, and that's awesome. But the kindness of God, if we want the real definition of kindness, when we talk about the kindness of God, it goes to another level. In that while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, he said, here's my kindness. Right? In the book of Luke chapter 6, verse 35 and 36, it says... What does the first thing here say? Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. Why will you be acting as the children of the Most High? Because you're reflecting what the Most High actually does. Because what does he do? What does the next thing say? Because he is kind to those who love him back and praise him and thank him day after day, morning, noon, and night. No. It says, for he is kind to those who are unthankful. And God, this is not fair. How can you show kindness to the wicked? You should show kindness to me. I came to church this morning. I gave my tithes and offerings. I got up early and praised you. I did this and this, and I've been serving you for 10 years and 20 years. You should be kind to me, not to the wicked. But he sets an example for us, and he takes kindness to another level, where it's not just about being kind to those who are kind to you. It's not just about being kind to those who are good to you, but to be kind, here it says, to the unthankful and wicked. So next time your husband and wife maybe makes a lovely meal for you, and, uh, or you make a lovely meal for your husband or wife, and they don't say anything back to you, they're just ungrateful for that meal, what should you do? Next time you should forget it. I'm not making that again. You should do that and do it all the more lovingly. Isn't that the response of kindness? Maybe not our type of kindness, but God's type of kindness is, I'll do it all the more lovingly again. Do you understand? The kindness of God takes it up to another level. The next time somebody does something bad to you, don't say, forget about it. I'm not going to ever help them again. No. The response of kindness is to go and help them again, but then go even the extra mile and turn the other cheek. This is the kindness of God. This is what is exemplified in Jesus Christ. This is the example that he left for us, and he's calling us 
through the power of the Holy Spirit to produce this fruit in our lives so that we also can reflect the kindness of God to others. Because if you're kind to other people, the world does that all the time. People outside, they do that all the time. But do you know what people will just stand with jaws dropped? How is that possible? Is when you forgive the unforgivable. When you love the unlovable. When you go the extra mile for someone who nobody would want to go the extra mile for. And then people will look back and say, where did that come from? Where does that nature come from? How do you have grace to do that? That's the kindness of God. That's what he's looking for us to do and to show. Otherwise, you know what differentiates us from the animal kingdom? It's kindness, right? Animals are kind to their, maybe their offspring and their herd or something like that. But tell me the last time that you saw a lion chasing after a giraffe and finally catching up the giraffe to eat him. And then he says, oh, are you discouraged today? Let me encourage you. Let me help you out. I won't eat you today. Oh, did you hurt your leg? Oh, let me take a look at that. When did you ever see that happen in the animal kingdom? When did you ever see that happen in nature there? Because this is the calling that God has called us to do and live by, the kindness of God. We are the people that says, when we see our enemy hurting, when we see that person that's hurt us, that's offended us, and they're going through a hard time, we don't stand back and say, serves you right, I remember what you did to me. No. We take a step of faith and we go the extra mile and say, can I help you? How can I be kind to you in that situation of your life? I know I told you I wouldn't make you sweat before, but yes. It's tough. It's not easy. It's difficult. I speak for myself as well. It's very hard. But this is the kindness of God. This is the level that God has set, the example that he's given to us. While we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, his kindness was revealed. And that's what he's looking for in our lives as well, right? Uh, Ephesians, chapter, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. And then what you do? Instead, be kind to each other. So how do you read this verse? Okay, if I'm bitter at somebody, what should I do? Instead, be, be kind. If I have rage in my heart towards somebody, instead I should be? kind. If I, have said, if I have anger against somebody, instead I should be kind. And you might have a legitimate reason to be upset with that person. You might have a legitimate per, a reason to say, they have hurt me. They have offended me. They have done harm to me. They have, you know, have, they have not been Christ-like to me. Why should I be Christ-like to them? There might be a legitimate reason for that, but here it says, instead be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Just as God through Christ has forgiven us, just as how we were enemies of God, just as how we were sinners, just as how we were alienated from God and far away from God, and we were enemies of God and God forgave us in the same way. If we are angry with somebody, if we're upset with somebody, bitterness, rage, harsh words, slander, all of these things, here the apostle exhorts us to be kind to that person. I want, I want all of us to think right now, who is that one person in our life that really ticks us off? Like maybe when we were listening to the message about patience last week, you were thinking, I have no patience with this one person. Maybe today's the day that you show love through an act of kindness to that person. Maybe today's the day that you reach out to that person. D.L. Moody said, the hardest thing for God to do is to make us kind. That's pretty impressive for D.L. Moody. He said, the hardest thing for God to do is to make us kind. Very quickly, when we see, I just want to take you through a little bit of the Old Testament. There's two examples that really come to my mind when I think about kindness in the Old Testament. And one, one of which is which we spoke about a few weeks ago when we were talking about coming to the table of the Lord and we were looking at the series of the life of David. And we spoke about the story of Mephibosheth. Does anyone here remember that? One, two, Okay couple people, right? The story of Mephibosheth. David wanted to show kindness to the, to the family of Jonathan, and so he brought Mephibosheth, who was lame, 
into his, his, into his house, into his palace, and to eat at his table all of the time. Second Samuel 9 verse 3 says, the king then asked him, is there anyone alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show kindness to them. No. If so, I want to show God's kindness. Remember, what's that difference between just kindness and God's kindness? Kindness is something that maybe anyone and everyone and all of us, you know, if we have a heart in us, maybe we can be kind to others. But God's kindness is to be kind to who? Your enemies, those that have hurt us. And so who, who does he say here? In this verse says, is anyone still alive from, not Jonathan's family, David says. He doesn't say, because Jonathan was his friend. He says, is anyone alive still from? Saul's family, my enemy's family. Is there anyone still alive from his family? I want to show God's kindness to that person. And that's what he did. It was extraordinary kindness. Another story that really comes to my mind is in the Old Testament is the story of Ruth. Uh, we studied it uh, probably a couple of years back. We studied about the, the life of, uh, of Ruth and how this story exemplifies the kindness, uh, the kindness of God. Uh, we see how Ruth, um, just to give you a, a quick recap of the story, Naomi, uh, she was married and she left Bethlehem because of a famine. She had two sons. They got to the land of Moab. The two sons got married. Both the sons died. The, fa- the husband died as well too. So Naomi was just left with her two daughter-in-laws. And so she told the two daughter-in-laws, you know, you can go back to your house and to your country and to your people because look at what has happened. But Ruth so beautifully replied in Ruth chapter one and verse 16 and 17, this is the kindness of Ruth that she displays to Naomi. Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Sounds like a wedding vow, but it's between a mother-in-law and her daughter-in-law, right? Such intense kindness. And then they come, to, they come back to Bethlehem and Boaz lets Ruth glean in his fields to get some food. Again, we see the kindness of God. It's that word hesed in the Old Testament, a Hebrew word that reflects the kindness and love and loyal love, covenantal love that's experienced there. And then Ruth's act of kindness to the family to marry Boaz, who was much older than him, but Ruth married Boaz in order so that there could be a restoration for the family and there would be a lineage that would come even for Naomi. And so she makes a sacrifice, the kindness of Ruth to Naomi and her family even to marry Boaz. It's a beautiful story of love, grace, and kindness, redemption, forgiveness, we can see in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see also so many times Jesus reflecting kindness. Jesus was never too busy to show compassion and kindness to others. You never see him uh, uh, pushing people away, but always allowing people to come to him. He once saw, he was once in a city where he saw a, a woman who was a widow because her son, her only son, had just died. And Jesus saw the need. The woman didn't ask anything. The people didn't ask anything. But in Luke 7, verse 13, it says, when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. It was the kindness of God. Don't cry, he said. And he brought the boy back to life. It was an act of kindness. Now, probably a much greater act of kindness than you and I can probably, you know, do or what we might see on a daily basis. But it was nonetheless an act of kindness by Jesus. Not because someone asked him to do, but the overflow of his compassion touch that woman's need. In Luke 13, we read about a woman who was crippled uh, by an evil spirit and she was bent over for 18 years. Again, no one asked her, asked Jesus anything. She didn't petition Jesus and said, can you heal me or anything like that? She didn't ask anything, but Jesus saw her need and the Bible says he was moved with compassion and he touched her and healed her. In John 8, we read a, a story about the Pharisees. They, they bring to Jesus a woman who was, who was caught in adultery and they wanted to test Jesus. Now, Jesus already had a reputation for being good and kind. Jesus already had a reputation for showing mercy. So they thought to themselves, we're gonna bring this woman over to him. She has, she's guilty of adultery. Let's see what he, he does, right? We're hoping that he will default to his nature to show kindness. We're, we're gonna trap him because we wanna get him in the very act of kindness, right? These guys were, were scheming to try to get Jesus in the act 
not of sin, but in the act of kindness, because Jesus had a reputation of being kind. Jesus had a reputation of being merciful, right? And so they, 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 come, to, they come to Jesus, and true to form, true to Jesus' as a character, he was kind, right? But what they didn't suspect was that he would say, fine, you want to stone her, stone her. But let the, fir- let the person that's without sin cast the first stone. Oh, and then they were all guilty, and then they all had to leave. And then Jesus said, I don't condemn you, but he told her as well, go and sin no more. Right? I think one of the stories in the New Testament that really sticks out to me is the story of Paul and Silas in the book of Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas, they were, they were in prison for their faith, uh, and at midnight there was a huge, they were, they were singing praises to God in, in this prison, and then there was a huge earthquake, and the Bible says that the doors of the prisons were opened, the chains of the prisoners fell off. Paul and Silas at that point could have easily fled, and, and ran away for their, for their lives. They had every right to do so because they were imprisoned unjustly. But instead, what did they do? They stayed there as an act of kindness to the jailer. Because as, at the moment that the jailer looked around and thought, oh, all of these prisoners are, are left and I, I, I'm going to die because all these prisoners have, have fled. So the jailer thought, I might as well just kill myself because I'm going to die anyway. And as he was about to kill himself, Paul stopped him and said, hold on, we are still here. What would you and I have done? We would have probably fled. We would have ran for our lives. Look, the door is open. The chains are broke. Let me go. I'm out of here. But they stayed We don't know all the details. Maybe Paul, you know, Paul being Paul, knowing Paul's nature, Paul would have probably preached the gospel to him two or three times already, right? And maybe Paul and Silas stayed there as an act of kindness to the jailer because they knew full well that if they left, that, that jailer's life, he's gone. And that's why Paul cried out and said, don't kill yourself, we are still here. And what happened? Acts chapter 16, verse 32 and 33. They shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. That act of kindness by Paul and Silas to stay in the prison and not run for their lives, not take the easy way out, not flee for their own comfort, by not doing all of those things, but by staying there in the prison, that act of kindness led to the salvation of that jailer. And for that whole household to hear the gospel. The act of self-denial. The act to say, I would rather suffer so that I can have an opportunity to share the gospel. Let my suffering be an act of kindness so that others might hear the word of God and might hear the gospel. That act of kindness led to this amazing story. They chose to deny themselves. They chose to deny their freedom. They chose to stay there in prison, and the denial of their freedom led to the freedom of the jailer because now he knew Jesus Christ as his Savior. And here's the challenge for us. As we act in kindness to others, as we act and show the love of God to others, can we act in kindness to others at the very denial of our own pleasure and our own comfort and our own convenience? That's what we see here. Self-denying, is a, self-denying kindness is a Christ-like quality. Can I remind you of this? This little alpha prayer card that hopefully we've written down on the back here, a couple of names. What would you do to see those people come to an alpha and hear the gospel and maybe give their lives to Jesus? Would you stay in prison? Paul and Silas did. Would you deny yourself? Would you make that sacrifice? Paul and Silas did so that jailer could hear the gospel and that whole household could hear the gospel. Self-denying kindness, it's a Christ-like quality. So the question is, what should I do? Through the help of the Holy Spirit, because remember, this is a fruit of the Spirit. What should I do now? As the Holy Spirit fills me, as the Holy Spirit empowers me, um, I'd like to just look at one story, which we read, Keisha read the parable of the Good Samaritan, so I won't go over the whole thing because we just read it, right? A, a religious leader came to Jesus and asked, how, should I inherit etern- how can I inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what, what, what does Moses say? And he says, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And him trying to be a smart man said, 
who's my neighbor? And then Jesus, good thing he asked, actually, because then we got this amazing parable. And then this parable of the Good Samaritan. And I think there's just three lessons as I close off I just want to highlight to you. Three lessons I think that we can learn about kindness from this example of the Good Samaritan. Number one is to be watchful, right? The Lord will allow situations and circumstances uh, to come our way, and we must be watchful. Even like Paul and Silas, they were really watchful. They were watchful to show kindness. And God will allow situations and circumstances to come, and we need to be watchful. We live in a generation at a time that we live such busy lives, and we're just so razor-focused on what we have to do that many times, you know, we're just looking at this one job, I need to get this done, and we don't see the suffering and the need of others that are around us. We're not sympathetic to what others are going on, what's happening to others around us, right? We can't be bothered with interruptions, There are more problems to us than blessings, right? I think all the times when you see Jesus being interrupted by somebody else in the Gospels, you see him taking time apart to bless that person, right? Rick Warren said the number one enemy of kindness is busyness. We get so busy that we can't even think of somebody else. We get so busy we can't even think of the need of someone else, right? Many times we're so busy, but I can also add to that many times we're, we, we desire not to be inconvenienced as well. We need to be sensitive to the needs of others around us. Many times we're so oblivious to the hurting, the discouraged, the downcast, the needy that are so close to us, right? It could be in our family, it could be here in our church, it could be in our community, our work, our school, anywhere, right? Philippians 2 verse 4 says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others, too, right? Take an interest in others. Kindness starts at home. Often we overlook our immediate family. Often we overlook the kindness that we need to show to our husband or wife or brother or sister or mom or dad, right? Jesus was always mindful of what was happening around him. He was always mindful to be sensitive to the needs of others, and we should be as well. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, let us be watchful. The second thing is to be compassionate, right? In this parable, right, of of the Good Samaritan, we see that as the Good Samaritan came down the road, he was watchful to be able to see this man that was hurting and suffering, but he was also compassionate. The priest and and the Levite that walked by, they saw this man suffering and they just walked right by. They didn't show compassion. But it says in Luke 10, verse 33, then the despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Maybe the priest said, oh, I need to get to church. I can't stop and help. Right? Maybe I need to do this, and I need to do that. I need this other thing, and this thing, and that thing, and this religious activity, or that was, I, and I can't even stop to have compassion. Right? We need to be supportive of others in need through our words and through our actions. We studied earlier in the year about Joseph, and we saw how he went through so much hurt and pain, because remember, when we talk about the kindness of God, it's kindness to those who have done evil to us. And the Bible speaks about Joseph, how Joseph spoke kindly to his brothers. Joseph showed compassion to his brothers to help them in their time of need. And even after Jacob, Joseph's father died, and the brothers were scared and thinking, is Joseph going to take revenge on us now? Now's the perfect time. Jacob's dead. Now's the time for Joseph to exact revenge on these brothers who were so mean to him that threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. Now's the time. And when Joseph heard the news, his heart was sad. But the Bible says in Genesis 50, verse 21, it says, so he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. That's the kindness of God to even those people that did evil to him. We see so many examples about how Jesus moved with compassion. In Matthew, it says how Jesus saw a huge crowd and he stepped off the boat and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Another time in Mark, it says that he had compassion on these people because they were with him for three days and, he didn't, and they didn't eat anything. So he had compassion even for the physical needs of the people that were around him. He saw that some needed healing, but he also saw that, you know, somebody needed a burger, right? Because they were hungry. Jesus wanted to provide for the physical needs of the people, just like the Samaritan did. He was moved with compassion, and the Samaritan provided for the physical needs of that man. Here's the question. Does our kindness cost us something? Are we kind only when it's convenient to us, or are we kind when it actually costs us something? To be kind to your enemy will cost us something because we might have to humble ourselves, 
right? Are we kind only when it's convenient to us or are we kind when it actually costs us something and we have to pay a price? Maybe there's some monetary price that's involved in that as well. What did the Good Samaritan do? He gave the innkeeper some money and then he told him, when I come back, if there's still something going, don't worry, I'll cover the cost. That was an act of kindness. In everything that he did there, it's an act of kindness. Luke chapter 6, verse 36 says, you must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. So let the Holy Spirit fill our lives so that we can be compassionate. And the last thing is to be ready, right? Be ready. The other two men, they weren't really ready. They were coming along the, along the pathway and they weren't ready to act. They weren't compassionate. But this good Samaritan, he was ready to sacrifice because he had bandages with him. He had oil with him. He had wine with him. He was ready with money to pay the innkeeper. Here's the question, are we ready to act? I was seeing this story this week about uh, this guy. His name is Bob, right? And Bob's 94 years old. Every Saturday, he goes to Dollar General store and buys a box of Hershey chocolate bars. And when he does that, he gives two, two chocolate bars to the cashier and one chocolate bar to the person behind him. And then he gives out the rest to others, right? For more than 10 years, he's given out about 6,000 chocolate bars, Hershey chocolate bars, right? He keeps hundreds of them in his freezer as well so that he can be ready to give to people, right? Sometimes he leaves chocolate bars at people's doorstep so they know Bob was there. He brings 18 chocolate bars when he goes to see his doctor because he knows how many people work at the doctor's office. He's ready. He's stocked and ready as an act of kindness to show love, right? Romans 12 verse 13 says, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them, right? Many times we think, oh, somebody else will do it. Call on somebody else. God will inspire somebody else. Let, let me give other people a chance. No, we must be ready. Don't leave it for someone else to do. If you see it, if you sense it, if your heart is moved with compassion, it's because God wants us to act, right? Maybe our heart is moved with compassion for so many things. We've gone to step two, right? We're watchful, we're compassionate, but we haven't gone to step three to actually be ready to act, right? Victor Hugo wrote, you can give without loving, but you can never love without giving. The great acts of love are done by those who are habitually performing small acts of kindness. We pardon to the extent that we love. I think the story of the prodigal son is an excellent example how the son left the father and lost all of his money and all of his inheritance. The father's heart was broken and grieved and hurt by his own son. But finally, when the son came to his senses and said, I need to return back to my father, right? When he came back to his father's house, what did the father do? Did he say, hold on, wait out there. I need to process all this. This is too much for me. My son's coming back. I don't know what to do. Like, this is just, this is overwhelming for me. I can't do this. You left, you hurt me. You took all my money. I got to do my books. I got to figure out I got enough money to support you again. No. What does the Bible say? Luke 15, verse 20. And so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father was ready. He waited Day after day after day, when is my son coming home? When is my son coming home? When is my son coming home? He waited and waited for this amazing act of kindness, and it says he was filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, he embraced him, and he kissed him. He didn't say, wait outside, wash, take a shower, and then come in. No, he embraced him. He loved him. He showed him compassion. He was ready when his son came to him. He waited, and he was ready this is what God does for us. This is a picture of Christ for us, is that when we take the step to come to God, we take one step. He takes a thousand steps to us, and he says, come, my arms are open wide. Come, I'm ready, I'm waiting uh, to show you compassion, to show you love. This is what God in Christ Jesus shows to us as he redeems us and saves us and forgives us and sanctifies us and purifies us and accepts us into his family. He's waiting with open arms and he says, yes, this is what I want you to do as well. As we show kindness to others. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 and 10. So let, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, 
While we have the opportunity, while we have the time, the strength, the energy, the resources, let us do good. Let's ask the Holy Spirit. It's hard. There's a general type of kindness, maybe because of our humanity, that we can show to others. But the kindness of God is hard. It's difficult to show that. And that's why we need the help of the Holy Spirit to infill us, to, to, to flow through us. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when we see that person that's done harm to us, that's maybe gossiped about us, that said this about us, that's done this about us, and we say, I don't want to see that person, but then the kindness, the Holy Spirit is within us, and he's saying, show the kindness of God, and we need to say, Holy Spirit, help me. I need to be empowered by you to show kindness to that person that's done so much harm to me. But let's do good. Let's be kind. Let's be compassionate, and let's be ready to act, especially if it's for someone that has harmed us. Let's be kind to our neighbors through the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's a question if you want to think about when you see somebody to show them kindness. What would I do for people if I were Christ? What would I do for people if they were Christ? So if I was Christ, how would I act towards others? If they were Christ, how would they act? Richard Wormbrand, when he was in prison in Romania, he was beaten and tortured for his faith. And one day he was in a cell and he was freezing cold and he only had one blanket and he was clinging to that blanket. He saw another prisoner in the corner of that cell and they didn't have a blanket and they were freezing. And he thought, if that were Christ, would I give him my blanket? And of course the question answered himself and he gave him that blanket. And then when he, was, when he left prison, he wrote a book titled, If That Were Christ, Would You Give Him Your Blanket? It's about showing kindness to others. Now, remember this thing I told you about? All right, so there's a, there's a Bible verse that's here. You can read it. But guess what? It's not for you. Okay? This is not for you to hold on. If you look on the back, it says to, and it says from. So what I'd like you to do as an actionable step in an act of kindness I want you to think of somebody that you could go to, maybe not here in church, maybe some, it could be somewhere, someone in church, but maybe it's somebody at home or you're in your community or wherever, maybe sometime this week, and you see somebody, and then maybe you can write their name on it to and from, and maybe you can write a little note on the back and say, hey, I'm praying this blessing over your life. Maybe that person doesn't know Jesus. Maybe that's the opportunity to start a conversation about faith with this little act of kindness, right? Maybe you show them this and you say, hey, I just, I just want to let you know I'm praying for you. And, you know, this verse is such a blessing to me. I'm, I'm praying this verse for your life as well. Can we try to do that this week as an act of kindness? Here's a bonus, okay? All right, if you, have, if you have this verse, I think there should be five of them. This verse, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. Look at your verse. If you have 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, can I just ask you to come up to the stage for a second? 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound to every good work. It should be a pink card. And has, if, if you have that, can you come up to the stage? <laughs> all right, I got one. There should be four others. Don't be shy. You'll regret it if you don't come. <laughs> when I tell you what I'm going to do, I know you're... Oh, there's two, all right. I'm waiting for three more. Can I get three volunteers then? <laughs> Anyone? One? Who, who said me? Reggie. Reggie, come. Reggie? Can I get two more volunteers? All right. Thanks, Jesse. Can I get one more volunteer? All right. Sylvia? So what I have for you, okay, we got these five people. I have in my pocket. I know you're going to regret it. Now, if you had the verse too late, that's it. We got our five people. Right? No take backs now. I have Tim Horton cards. So I'm going to give you one each. But guess what? It's not for you. <laughs> but what I want you to do is, can I just borrow this for a second? I want you to take that card, the card that you have, and pair it with this and give it to somebody as an act of kindness. Can you do that? Yes. Right? May or maybe it's, maybe it's to go out with somebody. Thanks, guys. Can we get a round of applause for them? Yeah. All right. Maybe it's, to, maybe it's just to take somebody out for coffee. Now, if you didn't get a $5 Tim card, right, maybe, could you maybe get another card for yourself and pair that with the card that you have? And as an act of kindness, say, hey, I'm praying for you. I want to bless you. 
Maybe it's to go out with the person for coffee and say, let's have a conversation about faith, right? You know, the, I think I had one more slide to go back to. You know, the, it, in, in the book of Romans, in, the, in the, the Romans in their early church time, you know what happened? And I'll just close with this. Uh, at the bottom of your bulletin, you'll have some questions about what is your kindness question, and I just want to encourage you when you go home to read some of that and maybe take time to just evaluate your life and see sort of where you're at and fill out the last thing to show the kindness of Christ, I will do blank for someone. But you know, the word kindness, which we said before, but uh, the word kind is Christos. And the word for Christ in Greek is Christos. And the Romans actually got confused between the two words because Christians were kind. Christians show the love of God. And I wonder if people can be confused today as well and in our generation. Are you a Christian? That means you're kind. He's just going to sing a song for us and we're just going to listen to the words. And, and you, I, I just want to encourage you to think about who you can show kindness to this week. I want to encourage you just to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I'm just so far away from this. Can you fill me? Can you help me to show God's kindness? to those whom I need to show kindness to. Think about that as we listen.